I don't know what it is. Maybe it's the four two and a half gigabit ethernet ports. Maybe it's the solid black fanless design, or maybe it's the fact that it showed up with no operating system, just waiting for me to decide what to run on it. Whatever the reason, this little box is very appealing. And not just to me. It seems like a lot of home labbers and tinkerers are looking into systems like these for affordable firewall builds. But, well, I've never actually tried one. So when I stumbled across a deal on this model with Intel's newer N150 CPU, I had to pick it up. On paper, it's got enough power to be more than just a router. You could run multiple VMs and containers. Heck, you could even run your router inside a virtual machine so that you could do lots of cool stuff with this. This might be the perfect solution for someone looking for a powerful, flexible, and affordable software router. Or it could just be a slapped together AliExpress hunk of junk. Who knows? Let's find out. Not too long ago, I was going back through some old video ideas from way back when I first started the channel and found one about covering one of these little fanless firewall appliances. And well, I just never did. So I decided to look around and see if anything piqued my interest. And since I wasn't really in a hurry, I decided to go to AliExpress to see if I could find a really good deal. There are maybe hundreds or thousands of different brands and models, but I ended up coming across this one from Topton, which I believe is the X2E N150 model. It's a little bit hard to tell with all of the stuff just crammed into the listing and whatnot. Topton was one of the few brands I saw that I had actually heard of. Uh, I think there were some reviews of their systems over at servethehome.com. And so when I saw this model, which also had the Intel N150, well, it seemed like a pretty safe bet, especially at just 120 bucks. Well, that was before shipping and then some of the extra fees and then import duties and okay, well, still $185 isn't too bad, especially since we're getting one of Intel's newer low powered CPUs. The N150 is a slightly improved version of the ever popular N100. It has a slightly higher clock speed and rather than Intel's UHD graphics, it just has Intel graphics. Yeah. Intel, what are your product names even? It has a faster GPU. Other than that, it's basically the same as the N100. It includes four of Intel's efficiency cores, so no hyper-threading. It technically supports up to 16 gigs of DDR4, DDR5, or LPDDR5 memory, and it has a TDP of just six watts. Now, also like the N100, it only supports nine lanes of PCIe Gen 3, but for a little device like this, that's probably not a huge deal. While I've never found the N100 to be quite as amazing as some folks think it is, it's still a very solid little CPU. It boasts a great balance of performance and efficiency, at least for lighter workloads like you might find in a home lab setting. So if the N150 is even just a bit better, I imagine this little system could be really useful. Not only could this function as a powerful little router, you could probably use it to stream media, run Home Assistant, or host your own applications you've developed with your awesome Python skills. Oh, wait, what's that? You haven't learned Python yet. Oh! Well, you should check out Boot.dev, the sponsor of today's video. If you've ever tried learning Python or any coding online, you've probably run into the biggest problem, which is boredom. That's why Boot.dev is tackling backend development in the smartest way possible, by making it fun. Backend development is what makes the internet work. It's the code that handles databases, APIs, all the stuff that keeps websites and apps running behind the scenes. And Boot.dev teaches you how to master it from start to finish with hands-on lessons in Python and Go. You won't just read about how these systems work, you'll actually get to build them. With a mix of theory as well as real projects, an active Discord community, and gamified learning that keeps you engaged, Boot.dev helps you stay motivated while actually writing real code. You'll earn XP, level up, complete quests, and even climb a global leaderboard, all while developing the skills to land a real job in backend development. Plus, you'll be able to start building your own projects that you can run on cool little servers like this. To make sure you're getting your money's worth, every course has a free demo, and there's a 30-day no-questions-asked refund policy. So if you're ready to build the backend systems that power the web, head over to boot.dev and use my code HARDWARE-HAVEN to get 25% off your entire first year if you choose the annual plan. When you purchase these, there are a few options for RAM and storage, but I find it's probably best to just bring your own, so I purchased a bare-bones unit. On the front of the unit, or the back, I'm not really sure, it kind of just depends on what you prefer, but on this side, there's a barrel jack for the 12 volt power supply, four Intel i226V 2.5 gigabit network interfaces, and then another RJ45 COM port for serial. On the other side, there's the power button, 4G and 5G SIM card slots, four USB 2.0 ports, two USB 3 ports, and then HDMI and DisplayPort. I passively mentioned this in the intro, but this thing is completely fanless. <laughs> Get it? I passively meant, no, I was kind of stupid. The system is passively cooled so there aren't any fans. Instead, the case acts as a large heatsink with fins on top to help with heat dissipation. Because of this, you don't really have to worry about dust buildup, and the system is dead silent. On the bottom, you can remove four screws to access the motherboard. 
Here you can get to a single SODIMM socket, which makes sense since the N150 only supports one memory channel. For storage, there's a PCIe Gen 3x2 NVMe socket, as well as a SATA port, which can be used with an included adapter. There's these screw holes that let you mount a drive to the inside of the cover, but, well, it's a bit awkward to try to squeeze everything in, but, well, it works. There's also a B key M.2 socket, but I'm pretty sure this is only for a 5G cellular card. And as far as I can tell, it only supports USB. Sadly, I don't have any of the hardware or an extra SIM card to test any of that stuff out. I don't really travel, so uh, it's never something that comes up for me. There's also a mini PCIe slot, I think for another cellular card for the 4G SIM slot, but I actually found that this one supports one lane of PCIe Gen 3. So you could use this with some sort of add-in card to add some more functionality, or just use an adapter so that you could add another NVMe SSD. There are a few other little interesting things I noticed inside the case, such as the system fan header. It uses a little Molex Pico blade connector rather than just a standard four pin fan header. So if you want to use it, you'd have to get a bit creative like I did with this HP mini system from a previous video. So yeah, I guess you could add a fan to this and I guess stick it to the top or something. I don't know. I don't know if that's all that helpful, but something that might be more helpful is the front panel header. I couldn't find a pinout for it online and it didn't seem to be labeled on the board at first, but that's because the pinout is actually hidden underneath the memory if you have memory installed. Now, sadly here, they use a smaller two millimeter pitch connector rather than the standard DuPont connector. So you can't just easily hook up like a standard power button from a PC case or something. But once again, if you want to get creative, you can. I also found these screw terminals near the DC jack, which, well, was a bit odd. I correctly assumed that these were wired up to the positive and negative pins of the DC jack, so you could use this to wire up some sick 12 volt LEDs. I'm just kidding, that'd be a terrible idea. I guess a better use for this would be if you wanted to wire up power to this without having to use the barrel jack. Like maybe if you wanted to wire this directly into a vehicle or something. I'm sure there are other more industrial uses for something like this connector. And if you know, let me know down in the comments. To get the system booted up, I needed to add in some RAM and an SSD. I didn't realize that I didn't have any 16 gig DDR5 SODIMMs on hand, so I decided to just try out a 32 gig stick and hope for the best. And well, it booted up just fine. So while I don't think this is officially supported by Intel, it seems like 32 gigs works just fine. In fact, later I realized you could buy these off of AliExpress with 32 gig sticks. So yeah, I guess that's pretty normal. The BIOS actually had a lot of options available, but very few that I would ever really consider messing with. So I just got an NVMe SSD installed so that I could start running some benchmarks because, well, I really wanted to see how well that N150 stacked up. For comparison, I grabbed the results from a Camry mini PC with an Intel N100, as well as this HP ProDesk 600 G6 mini, which I looked at recently that has an Intel i5 10500T. I started out with Geekbench 6, and here the top down system with its N150 managed single and multi-core scores of 1261 and 2587 respectively. When compared to the N100 mini PC, we see just a very small uptick in performance in both tests. And you can also see here that the HP G6 mini handily outperformed both of the other systems. In Cinebench R23, the top down system managed single and multi-threaded scores of 846 and 2035. But what happened with that N100 system? With a CPU that should be slower, it managed to be around 7% faster in the single-threaded test and over 15% faster in the multi-threaded test. Why was that happening? Well, my first thought was thermals. Sure, that N100 system has a slightly older CPU, but it's also actively cooled, whereas the top-end system is passively cooled. This seemed like a pretty obvious culprit, and I did see some thermal throttling, but only for a few seconds right when Cinebench first started up. After that though, it seemed like the main reason the N150 was being throttled back was due to a power limit, not a thermal limit. And I couldn't find anywhere in the BIOS to change any settings for this. Now, since Geekbench simulates a mix of real world workloads, often in short bursts, it makes sense that the N150 was able to hold its own there. But in longer sustained tasks like a Cinebench render, the actively cooled system, which I would assume probably also had a higher power limit, ended up performing better. So that's something to keep in mind if you don't necessarily need a passively cooled system for your setup. But there's a good chance you don't really care all that much about raw performance and you really care about efficiency and total power draw. And here, well, it's not, it's not great. When just sitting idle in Windows, the top end system drew around 10 and a half watts. That's almost twice as much as the other two systems. In the Cinebench multi-threaded render, the top end system drew around 18 watts, which was the exact same as the N100 mini PC. That's less than half the power of the ProDesk Mini, but the ProDesk was substantially faster in that particular benchmark. Now, it's important here to remember that you connect the power supply to the PC, not the CPU. While the N150 might be a bit more efficient, the overall efficiency is going to depend on the system as a whole. So yeah, within this sample of systems, the top 10 wasn't the best in terms of power draw and efficiency. But you also have to keep in mind that we're comparing a system with four NICs to systems that each only have one. 
All right, so that's how it handled a couple of benchmarks, but what about actually putting this thing to use? Well, first, as I normally do, I installed Proxmox. I initially installed Proxmox 8.4, but I ended up running into some issues, specifically when trying to get the GPU working with FFmpeg. And I pretty quickly realized that with a newer CPU like this, it would be helpful to move to a more recent kernel. So I switched over to Proxmox 9, which uses Linux kernel 6.14. After getting that installed, I ran PowerTop Autotune and the Auto ASPM script, and I also removed the display cable to try to see how much lower I could bring the total system power draw. And it did come down a little bit when sitting at idle, we were seeing somewhere between 8 and 9 watts. Using the Proxmox community scripts, I had no issues installing a few VMs and containers like I normally would, running things like Home Assistant, Jellyfin, and Crafty Controller all without issues. In Jellyfin, I was pretty easily able to set up QuickSync for hardware accelerated transcoding. All I had to do was make sure that I installed the non-free Intel media drivers to the host system. The transcoding performance was good, but it was about on par for what I would expect from any somewhat modern Intel CPU. For example, it handled 10-bit 4K AGVC with VCC tone mapping enabled just fine, rendering over 40 frames per second. So I would say in most scenarios this would work just fine for your media server of choice, and it could also work pretty well for other workloads, like for example if you wanted to run Frigate for monitoring some security cameras. I also ran a vanilla Minecraft server and Crafty controller, and here the system seemed to handle it without breaking a sweat. The server spun up in just a few seconds, and I didn't notice any issues with chunk generation or anything like that, at least when I was by myself. Obviously I can't vouch for how well this would handle hundreds of players, but it should work just fine for some servers for friends or family. With the 32 gigs of RAM I added, it definitely seemed like my limiting factor was going to be the CPU. With just 4 efficiency cores, there were definitely some times I saw substantial spikes in usage. That being said, I feel like we typically overestimate how much CPU horsepower we need when setting up home servers. If you're kind of like me, and you just like to run a few VMs and containers for some local services, I think this will work just fine. But if you're buying something like this, you're probably considering using it as a router by installing something like PFSense or OpenSense. So to try that out, I swapped out the SSD and installed the most recent version of OpenSense. With that, the Intel i226 Phoenix were immediately recognized, and I didn't notice any issues with them. I hooked one of them up to this little 2.5 gigabit switch for my LAN, and set up another as the WAN port, although it was just connected to my actual LAN. I used a 2.5 gigabit USB adapter to connect my laptop to the switch so that I could access the OpenSense UI. There I went through the setup wizard, and everything worked as expected. Now I want to be clear that I'm just a YouTuber that likes to tinker with this stuff, I'm not actually an IT guy or a network engineer, and so uh, I'm not the best probably when it comes to trying to benchmark networking. I did at least know that a speed test of the internet would be bottlenecked by my internet speed, which sadly isn't 2.5 gig. So instead, I just connected to an open speed test server that was upstream of the Topton router. Here I was getting pretty much wire speed in both directions. I also ran a variety of iPerf3 tests with both TCP and UDP traffic but honestly I wasn't all that sure how I should interpret those results. So instead, I just re-ran all of those iPerf tests, but with my laptop on the same network as the iPerf server. This way I was just completely bypassing the router. And well, here both sets of results were essentially identical, so it doesn't seem that the OpenSense router was a bottleneck in any way, which doesn't really come as a surprise though. According to some reviews from Patrick over at Serve the Home, similar 2.5 gigabit firewall appliances with much older CPUs, like the Intel J4125, could handle just simple routing without issue. So if you were to just run a simple firewall on this, you might be leaving a lot of CPU power on the table, which is why I think this is a great candidate for a virtualized router. Back in Proxmox, I created another VM, and then reinstalled OpenSense. After enabling IOMMU, I was able to pass through two of the four 2.5 gigabit NICs to the virtual machine. Back in OpenSense, I was able to set up those two ports as WAN and LAN like before, and I saw the exact same performance when running my tests. And now I still had two more ports available for anything else I wanted to have running in Proxmox. Now I know running the forbidden virtualized router can get people pretty worked up, and fair enough, there are downsides. Adding complexity to something as important as your router isn't necessarily the best idea, and it's a really bad idea to run a virtual router inside a hypervisor that you regularly use for testing or experimenting. But there are also a lot of positives when it comes to virtualizing. First, you can have more flexibility when it comes to running more network-related services on the same machine. Sure, things like OpenSense or PFSense have plugins and add-ons for things like ad blocking or VPNs or local DNS, but sometimes it can be nice to have more flexibility and isolation by running those different services in containers. Plus, with a virtual machine, you can easily create snapshots and then restore from them in case things break or an update fails. If you've been a viewer of the channel for quite a while, you might actually remember that I use a virtualized PFSense instance as my router, and that's worked pretty great for the last couple of years. 
Actually, I'm kind of tempted to swap that out with this little guy as a bit of an upgrade, but who knows? We'll see. So all in all, I think this is a pretty solid little system, but it does kind of fall into a weird middle ground. It really only makes a lot of sense if either A, you want a four port two and a half gigabit router, but you want it to have extra CPU horsepower to run other services or containers. Or B, you want a nice compact little server and specifically need it to have four two and a half gigabit ports and be passively cooled. If you just need a tiny little efficient server, there are plenty of much more affordable options out there that draw less power and or perform better. They just might not be passive and have those quad NICs. And if all you need is a basic four port router and you don't really need the extra performance or features that the N150 offers, there are much cheaper options out there. Many of them use CPUs like the N5105 or even the older J4125. Now I haven't tested those personally, like I said this is the first of these systems I've ever covered, but there are great reviews over at Serve the Home where they've reviewed quite a few of these pretty thoroughly. And from what I've seen, those older chips still handle basic routing just fine, and it seems like they draw pretty much around the same amount of power while doing so. But if you do need something in that middle ground where you do want the four 2.5 gig ports, you want the fanless design, and you want the extra CPU horsepower that the N150 has, there's not a whole lot I can really complain about with this guy. You kind of just get exactly what you're expecting. And if you don't mind waiting a bit for shipping, you can probably find a pretty good deal on these guys over on AliExpress. Hopefully you guys enjoyed this video or found it useful. If so, maybe consider giving a like, subscribing, or becoming a raid member for as little as a dollar a month. With that, you get early access to all of my videos without any ads. I think that's a pretty good deal. That's about it for this one though. So as always, thank you guys so much for watching. Stay curious, and I really can't wait to see you in the next one. Thank you.